We're in Acts chapter 11. Before we get there, though, I want to do a little word association with you this morning. Uh, it, we, could all, we all know what an American is, don't we? We all know what a, an Egyptian is, right? We all know what a Canadian is, don't we? And we know what a comedian is, right? Okay? But what about this word? What about Christian? What is a Christian? Now, I think if uh, we broke up into groups of ten this morning and, and asked you to answer that question, what is a Christian, you would not get ten of the same answers. You might get five different answers. You might get eight different answers. And, or maybe if, if you're walking on the street and someone came up to you, they, they probably wouldn't do this, but if you're walking down the street and someone came up to you and asked you if you're a Christian, some of you might respond with yes. Some of you might say yes, but. Some of you, you might say no, but. I mean, some of you, you'd probably say I am, but I'm not like that group of people. Uh, let me explain. What do you mean by that? And I think some of you, you were raised in a tradition where you like became a Christian. Like it was something that happened to you. Maybe if you're in like a tradition like mine, you, you prayed a prayer. It was praying a prayer that made you become a Christian. Or maybe in your tradition, it was a baptism that, that, that was it that made you become a Christian. Maybe it was whenever you were a baby and you didn't even remember it, but that was it. Now you're a Christian. Because you were baptized. Or maybe for you, it was, it was some kind of class that you had to complete before you were able to become a Christian. Or a confirmation type of thing before you became a Christian. Uh, some of us, many of us, we believe that um, our brand is the true brand of Christianity. Isn't that right? That's, we, we know that's what Catholics believe, right? That they are the church, right? Everybody else is something else, but they are the church. When in reality, they're just a church amongst the church, right? So maybe you believe that, and then Baptists, you know, we believe that our brand is the true brand, right? Um, some of you might would say, I was a Christian, but I'm not anymore. I was. But I'm not anymore. I, I grew up in church. Maybe I knew God at one point in time, but then I went to college and or this or that, and now I'm a, a tragedy happened in my life. I had a church hurt someone, and so I'm just I'm not a part of that. I have I want nothing to do with Christianity anymore. But then some of you might say, well, that's not true. You can't lose your Christianity, right? Once a Christian, always a Christian. But then others believe that, no, 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 there's actually certain things that you could do, certain sins that you could commit that would cause you to lose your Christianity. I mean, some of you, if you grew up in a tradition like me where you, where you had like pray in the prayer to become a Christian, you, you prayed that prayer like a thousand times, right? Because you didn't know if it took or not. You, you took it like Tylenol or something. I just don't know how the, if it's kicked in yet or not. And just to make sure, you prayed the prayer again. Some of you, though, maybe you're in here and, and you would say, you know, I, actually, I hate Christians. I've encountered some uh, very evil people who named the name of Christian. Maybe you had a very uh, religiously abusive father. Or maybe someone did you wrong in a business deal, and they claimed that they were Christian. Maybe uh, if you're in that box there, you would say that Christians, you'd define Christian this way, that Christians are uh, judgmental, homophobic moralists who think they are the only ones going to heaven and secretly relish the fact that everyone else is going to hell. Maybe you'd say, uh, maybe that's how you would define Christianity. Now, if you've never uh, felt that way, we all know people who do feel that way, don't we? Look, there's good news, though. And the good news is this, that none of what we just talked about 
is described in the Bible as being Christian. Uh, actually, the term Christian only appears three times in the Bible. And it's always uh, used as uh, this derogatory term where these people who are outside of the Jesus community are using this term to describe people who are inside of this Jesus community. The Jesus community never used it to describe themselves. It's a term that's not defined in Scripture. So why are we all known as Christians? This really brings us to our study in Acts today. And the reason I'm talking about this and I open with this is because in uh, Acts chapter 11 is where we see the first use of this term Christian. And so if you're new with us today, the book of Acts describes the events uh, that happened to the followers of Jesus after uh, Jesus had lived his ministry, died, rose again, and he ascended into heaven. And then the book of Acts records the history of what we call the early church, the followers of Jesus, and what they, uh, all the events in their lives. And, um, and so what we see here is after Jesus ascended into heaven, where, where are we in Acts chapter 11? He ascended into heaven and the church begins and people start telling people about Jesus and persecution breaks out uh, in Jerusalem. And so because of this persecution, the believers in Jesus scatter to different cities and towns and places and um, some of them ended up in this uh, town or this city called Antioch. And Antioch is a far way place, and it was primarily made up of Gentile people, Greek-speaking Roman people. And what happens is um, they, they scatter to Antioch, and they begin to tell these Jews and these Gentile people about what has happened in Jerusalem. And so he began to tell him about Jesus and this guy who died, but then he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave. And they're like, we saw him. And not, not just us that saw him, other people saw him too. I mean, he rose from the dead. And this is the guy we worship. And so they begin to tell these people about this. And what happens is a bunch of Greek-speaking, Roman-minded people begin to embrace this new Jesus movement. And then all of a sudden, this church gets started in Antioch. Now look, word gets back to Jerusalem. And, and so in Jerusalem, you have where kind of the church was started. And, and in Jerusalem, you have these apostles like Peter and James and John and them all there. And so word gets back to them that this church is beginning to birth in Antioch, and so what they do is they say, we got to send one of our guys to go check this out to make sure this is the real deal and to validate this thing. So they send uh, Barnabas, and Barnabas, uh, he gets there, and if you know Barnabas, we, what we've seen in the past in Acts is Barnabas is a really uh, devout, faithful guy, and he loves Jesus, he's an encourager, and so they send Barnabas, and Barnabas gets there, and there's loads of Christians. <laughs> okay, this, it's just Christianity, these, these believers are just exploding in Antioch. And so um, he goes, and he's like, i got to get reinforcements. I need some backup. And so he's like, let me go find Saul, who is Paul. Saul, Paul, you know him as either one. Uh, but Paul, remember we talked about Paul's conversion in chapter 9. And so Saul, Paul, he went back to his hometown. Do you know where Saul is from? Tarsus, yes. The first front row always knows. All right. Yes. Good job. Um, Saul of Tarsus. And so Barnabas says, hey, let's go get Saul. So he goes to Tarsus to find Saul because there's so many believers. And then the scriptures give us this little bitty snippet of uh, where this term Christian came from, okay? So we're in Acts chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 25 and 26. It says, So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch for the whole year. They met with the church and taught a great many people. 
A great many people are coming to believe in Jesus. And then we have it right here. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. The disciples were first called Christians. They didn't call themselves Christians. They were given this label by outsiders. They really didn't even embrace it because we don't see it much more in the New Testament. This was something that outsiders who see this, uh, these people begin to believe in Jesus and begin to live differently because of their faith. And, and, and they're looking on the outside, looking in, they're going, man, all these people, are, they're just like little Christs, you know? It's just like all these people, they're trying to be a little Christ. It was like this derogatory term to make fun of these people who were trying to be like Christ. That's how they described them. But the followers of Jesus didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves something that is way more terrifying. It's terrifying because it is far more defined. It's far more disturbing. And it's far more convicting than Christian. Okay. And uh, see, see, the thing is that you'll find so many facets of Christianity, and, and we'll find Christians on both sides of every uh, issue, won't we? Every political issue, you'll find Christians on both sides of it. You'll find people of all types of belief systems embracing Christianity and calling themselves Christians, but... We have this issue where there's so many people and so many misunderstandings around what is a Christian. We have that issue because it's not defined in the Bible. See, it's not, you can't, there's nowhere in the Bible you can go and say, okay, yeah, it says Christians are like this. Christians do that. It's not there. But... (laughs) If you look at the New Testament, you'll find this term that's used consistently to describe the people who are part of this Jesus movement. It's this term, disciple. Disciple. And this term, disciple, is clearly defined. We see it right here in our text today, verse 26. Down there it says, in Antioch, the disciples, the disciples were first called Christians. If you were to ask a disciple, what what are you? He wouldn't say Christian. He would have said, I am a disciple. I mean, even Jesus, he called his he never called his followers Christians. He called his followers disciples. And so let's define disciple because it, disciple defined for us is really the same as it was in the original language. And it means a learner or a pupil or uh, an apprentice, an adherent, a follower. That's what uh, a disciple is. See, a disciple is someone who's it's like, I'm trying to make a decision. How would you handle this? Well, that's how I'm going to handle it. I mean, you're looking at someone and you're saying, I'm trying to decide how to respond to this situation. How would you respond? Well, that's how I'm going to respond then. You you, you say, "Um, what would you do if you were me? Okay, that's what I'm going to do then. It's someone who says, "Um, where are you going? Well, that's where I'm going to go, (laughs) okay? I'm going with you. I'm going where you're going. How do you live your life? How do you react to this? How do you manage your relationships? Okay, well, then that's how I'm going to handle my life. That's how I'm going to manage my relationships. It's it's this saying, um, the answer before you give me the answer is yes. Right? My, my yes is on the table. What you say, I'm going to do. What you do, I'm going. I'm following you. 
I'm living like you. I'm seeking what you want. And then my yes is on the table. That's where I'm going. All right. I have a feeling you're like, I don't know. I don't know about this. Let's look at, uh, you can just flip a couple pages back to Acts 6. We, we're going to see how these, these people were called disciples. You can go ahead and throw that disciple slide on the screen. For <coughs> disciples. Acts uh, 6, 7 says, And the word of God continued to increase... And the number of what? Disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Let's flip a couple pages to Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, it says, And when he had come to Jerusalem, this is Paul after Paul was converted, it says, And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the what? The disciples. So the disciples were not just the twelve. Those are apostles. The disciples were all of the people who, this Jesus community, people who believed in Jesus. They, he attempted to join the disciples and they were afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. And then we see uh, this isn't just for men. This is for women also. If you look at verse 36 of chapter 9, it says, And now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha. And it says that she was full of good works and acts of charity. They were known as disciples. See, we can hide behind this word Christian, because that can mean anything. But if we dive into the New Testament and ask, now what were these guys really about? If we ask, how would they describe themselves? We see over and over again, they would describe themselves as disciples, which brings us to this question, are we disciples? Are we disciples? Or are we just Christians? Are we disciples? Are we people who put our yes on the table for Jesus and say, hey, I want to live like you. I want to respond like you. I want to react like you. I want to manage my relationships like you. Are we a disciple? Or are we just a Christian? Who knows what that means? We'll see. uh, We're going to flip to John 13. In John 13, uh, what we see is that this group of people who wanted to be disciples, they're following Jesus, and uh, they're gathered with Jesus. Jesus' ministry is coming to an end. He knows his time with his disciples are, is coming short and coming to a close, and so he has his last Passover with his followers. Many of you know it as the Last Supper. And um, so Judas has already gone to betray him. And, and he's like, I only have a, a, a few more things that I can teach before I die. And so you can imagine, if you can imagine like the last things you want to teach somebody, last things you want them to know before you go. This is it. In John thirteen thirty three, Jesus says, little children... Yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me. And just as I have said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And and so Peter perks up, okay, like, what are you talking about? Where are you going? We can't come. I go where you go, Jesus. I'm with you. I'll die for you. I'm with you. I'm going with you, Jesus. What do you mean we can't go with you, Jesus? It is... Is Andrew going? Because if Andrew's going, I'm going. Is this just mean I can't come? You know, so Peter, he's like, what's going on here? What do you mean? Jesus is like, are you kidding me? So here's the thing. He says, look, a new command I give to you. And this is really not a new command. This, uh, we see this command in the Old Testament. 
It's been around for a long time. What he's, he's saying is, he, he, this is unique. This, if you could just focus on one thing, then, then focus on this thing, okay? Forget the other commandments for now. Don't worry about that. Don't, don't try to, you know, fulfill all the Ten Commandments. Just focus on this one thing. If you could get this one thing right. He says, uh, a new command I give you, that you love one another. That you love one another another. But then he goes even further to define what that means. He says, love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. It's like if you take one thing away, if you get one thing, take this one thing. Love one another as I have loved you. So he says, you know, let's say Matthew, remember where you were? When I found you, Matthew, you were a tax collector. Remember, everybody, everybody thought you were a traitor, Matthew. And whenever I found you, we went, we went and hung out with all your people. And Peter and John, they're, they're freaking out over here because we're not supposed to hang out with tax collectors. Because you're a traitor, Matthew. Do you remember how I loved you, Matthew? Do you remember how I took you in? Remember that? That's how I want you to treat one another. That's how I want you to love one another. Hey, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, you remember this? Remember how you heard about me, Nathaniel? Your brother, he, he, he ran to you and he's like, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world. He's from Nazareth. Do you remember what you said, Nathaniel? Nathaniel, you said, can anything good come from Nazareth? You dissed my whole family, Nathaniel. And you remember how I responded to you? Remember how I treated you? I took you in. I said, come, follow me. I made you one of my guys. I forgave you. I forgave you. That's how I want you to love one another. I want you to love each other, forgive each other, bear with one another, just as I have Loved you. And then he goes on in verse 35. He says, by this, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples. And then he repeats it again. If you have love for one another. He didn't say, by this, all people will know you're my disciples. If you go to church every Sunday, if you carry your Bible around with you, if you pray in the morning and in the evening, people will know. If you post the verse of the day on Facebook, people will know you're my disciple. No, he said, the way people are going to know that you're with me is how you love one another. He's saying, look, I want people on the outside to look into this Jesus community. I want them to go, man, look how they love. Look how they treat. Look how they treat. Look how the men treat the women. I mean, look how the women treat the men. Look how they treat their widows and how they take care of the sick. Look how they they honor and elevate children. Look how they handle their money. That's it's like different than the way I handle my money. Look at the way they respond to persecution. It's, It's almost like they don't even fear death. Look at them love. Look at them love. Here's the point. Disciples love like Jesus. Disciples love like Jesus. He wants people to be able to see us, see how we treat each other, and see how we love each other, and go, wow, wow. I'm not sure if I believe what they believe, but man, are they some good people. Man, are they loving like I've never seen before. And so what we see, we're in Acts chapter 11, remember. We're in Acts chapter 11, and I think we see this in Acts chapter 11. So we see they were called Christians, which means that the outsiders looked in and said they're like little Christ. They're all trying to be like little Christ. Why 
are they getting this name? It's because they're disciples, and disciples, what do they do? They love like Jesus loved, and I think we see three different ways that they love here. They love like Jesus, but they love in this way. Uh, First thing, if you're taking notes, disciples are humble like Jesus. Disciples are humble like Jesus. If we're going to love well, we have to humble ourselves. Um, Not be prideful or arrogant. So we're in Acts chapter 11, and we're going to look at verse 24. Verse 24 says, For he was a good man. This is talking about Barnabas who came was sent to Antioch. He says, For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And great many people were added to the Lord. So I want us to see that Barnabas was one of the, the main leaders in the church who was sent to Antioch to really lead that thing, to make sure that they were solid in their faith. So he's over there. He's leading this thing. The church begins to grow. So he's got a growing, thriving ministry, and he's the lead guy in Antioch right now. And he does something that's very humble. Verse 25. So so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. So look, Barnabas, he's leading this thing. He's the main guy. Everybody loves Barnabas. It's going well. But Barnabas knows. He's humble enough to recognize that I can only take this so far. I need some help. I need some backup. So he goes and gets Saul, Paul. You know him. He's wrote a lot of the Bible. And he brings him to help him teach and train and love and care for this community in Antioch. And so that's what he does. That's a humble act for someone to be able to recognize, hey, even though I'm the top guy right now, I can't take this where it needs to go. I, I, I need more people involved if we're going to love this Jesus community well. And so he's humble enough to go get Paul and Saul and say, okay, Saul, Paul, I'm going to refer to you. You, you, are, you have a, a better gifting than me. You, are more, you have more revelation than I do. God's using you in mighty ways. I'm going to submit this to you and we'll do this together. That is a pretty humble thing to do, don't you think? And so how does that play out in your life? Okay, what does it look like for you to, to be humble like Jesus, to love people in a humble way like Jesus? I think just in our church here, I think it means maybe uh, that you could serve where you're needed, right? I mean, we all have giftings and talents, and, and I want you to operate in those and fulfill those, but sometimes there's just a need that needs to be filled in order to love the people of this church well. And sometimes it takes us humbling ourselves to meet that need. Some of you came from other churches and, and other backgrounds, and you came here and you're like, man, I'm a, I'm a, I, at my last church, I was a greeter. At my last church, I was the organ player. It's like, what are we going to do with an organ player? I mean, we don't, we don't have an organ. And so maybe you can't be an organ player here, but maybe you could be best suited to be an usher or a greeter or to go watch the babies. Those are the people who are getting the most crowns in heaven. The people who watch your screaming children (laughs) while you're in here. And so, serve where you're needed. Hey, maybe it's, it's, it's humbling yourselves to where I don't have to be in charge of everything. I don't have to be in charge. I mean, we see all the time, we have, there, there's many people in our church who are just really dominant and, and leader type, and they're great at that. But whenever you get a bunch of leaders on a team, it's like, everybody wants to do it their way, and oh, well, we're going to do it like this, and then someone else goes and changes it, and everybody's trying to make the last decision and try to get it how they want it. And sometimes it's just saying, no, look, I'm going to just humble myself. And even though I might have this dominant leader personality and gifting, hey, if it takes me humbling myself to make the whole thing work, that's what I'm going to do. So maybe just serve where you're needed. We need more nursery workers. Okay, you can sign up after church. (laughs) Um, (laughs) In uh, James 4, 6, he, he says this. He says, God opposes the proud but he gives grace to the humble. It's this sense of God resists the proud. And here's the thing. God's not the only one. I mean, you resist the proud. You, resist, you, who, who, you know you don't like to be around proud people, do you? 
You, if someone's always like arrogant and proud and always talking about themselves and their accomplishments and how great they are, you're like, I don't really care to be around you anymore. Okay? It's like all, we all resist the proud, don't we? And God says, look, that will creep up in your heart, this pride thing. And be careful because I tend to back away. Say, whoa there, buddy. But he gives grace to the humble. So the first thing we see here is that we gotta, we're going to move quickly. Uh, disciples are humble like Jesus. If we're going to love, we've got to be humble. Uh, second thing, disciples are generous like Jesus. Let's look at verse 27, Acts 11. It says, now in these days the prophets... Uh, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined every one according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of of Barnabas and Saul. So what we see is that the, this prophet came and said, hey, there's about to be this, this terrible famine and it's really going to hit hard in Judea. And, and so the disciples there said, all right, look, let's, let's gather up some funds. Let's all let's sacri- give sacrificially as much as we can. Let's give it and send it so that they'll be taken care of. They were uh, generous like Jesus, which is kind of similar to um, if there was a natural disaster, we just had th- you know, three sweep through right here where we had Harvey, and then right after Harvey, we had Irma, and then right after Irma, we had this terrible Nate, you know, and Nate came through and almost wiped us out. But you know who's the first on the scene after a natural disaster? Christians. Christians are. Disciples. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Disciples are. Thank you for catching me. Disciples are. Followers of Jesus. They're people who are just like, hey, you got a need? We're going to help you. We're going to, be, we're going to give. We're going to be generous like Jesus. And so in, uh, many of you know this verse. It's John 3.16 that says, For God so loved. Remember, we're talking about love today. God so loved the world. That, what did he do? He gave. he gave. What does that mean? What does that mean? Love gives, doesn't it? Love gives. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Love gives. And we see in our text that these disciples, they were generous like Jesus is generous. And so that's just, you let the Holy Spirit speak to you on how that ministers to you. But we are to be generous, not stingy, not closed, handed with our stuff. We're to be open-handed. Say, how can I help? You got a need? Let's meet a need. See a need, meet a need. Love gives. Third thing. Disciples tell people about Jesus. Disciples tell people about Jesus. Acts 11. Let's look at verse 20. So these these disciples who go into Antioch, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, Who coming to Antioch, are you reading with me? What does it say there? They spoke, didn't they? They spoke to the Hellenists. They spoke to the Hellenists. Also, what were they doing? Preaching the Lord Jesus. So we see that these disciples, as they went, as they entered new towns, as they traveled, they spoke and they were preaching, but they weren't just preaching about anything. They were preaching about Jesus, weren't they? Verse 21, so what's the result of that? And the hand of the Lord was with them. How many of you want the hand of the Lord with you? Yep, me. I hope you do. Like the favor of the Lord, the hand of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord going with you. The hand of the Lord was with them because they were what? Speaking. They were telling people about Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And great number who believed turned to the Lord. People were getting saved. The only way they were getting saved was because disciples. Now again, remember. These disciples that are, that are scattered, these aren't like the 12. These disciples, they're just the everyday, regular, that's you and, and me, and they're just the regular disciples. But wherever they go, they're telling people about this Jesus. This Jesus that changed everything. Disciples tell people about Jesus. Now you go, all right, 
look, Justice, you tell us every week to tell people about Jesus. Can you give it a rest? It's like, this is one of your points every sermon. I'll stop telling you about Jesus when you start telling people about Jesus, okay? <laughs> no, but what we see, I haven't just, like, came up with this stuff. I mean, we see every single chapter of the history of the church. People are telling people about Jesus. It's almost like this needs to be, you know, an essential part of our lives. Let's look. This is, the, like, the last thing, that what we call the Great Commission, and you, many, many of you know it. Maybe you haven't memorized. It's in Matthew 28, verse 19. This is like the last thing Jesus tells his disciples before he ascends. It says, And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. This making disciples is this, this thing where you are like causing people to become followers of Jesus. Where, where, where you're like persuading people, convincing people to come and follow Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus. So go and make disciples. You can't do that without telling people about Jesus. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them. Teaching them requires telling them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. How many want God with you? When Jesus is with you, what did he say he'll be with you if you're doing? Telling people about Jesus. Some of you are like, man, I haven't felt God's spirit in a long time. I, don't, I haven't felt him close. I don't know. I feel so distant from God. I feel like I'm so cold in my spirit. I don't know what's going on with me spiritually. And Jesus is saying, look, I told you I'd be with you when you're telling people. About me. When have you told anyone about me? And so the, the point is this that I think that's the most loving thing you can do for somebody is tell them about Jesus. Yeah. I mean, someone who's they're headed to hell, the best thing you could say is, let me tell you about Jesus. So what we see is that the disciples love like Jesus, and the way that played out in Acts chapter 11 is that they were humble like Jesus, that they were generous and open-handed like Jesus, and they told people about Jesus. The point is, if you don't get anything else today, if you just get one thing to remember today, remember this. Go back to the first thing. Love like Jesus. Love people. Love one another like Jesus has loved you. That's the main thing. Just love people. Love people. If you, if you don't even... How about let's just not even worry about... All the rest of the Ten Commandments right now. Let's just leave here today and say, I'm going to love. Like, like, what would it look like? Let's just brainstorm for a minute. What would it look like if in your family, let's just take like three months. For the next three months, it's like in your family, you get together, mom and dad and kids, you're together, and it's like, we're just going to have a love Fest, okay? It's just going to be like, we're just going to be ridiculous lovers of each other for the next three months. We're, we're going to serve. We're, we're going to give generously. We're, we're going to zip our mouth shut. And we're just going to love each other. Can you imagine what that would do for your family? Like, go home today. Say, hey, our family meeting, family meeting. Let's just three month challenge, okay? We're going to love each other. Just love each other. Um, can you imagine if in our nation, like just in our nation, if just the Jesus followers decided that I'm just going to love people the way that Jesus loved me. Can you imagine what would happen in our nation if just Jesus followers decided I'm going to love like Jesus loves? Can you imagine where our world would be if we just got this one thing right. If we just got this one, this thing, this loving like Jesus. I think Jesus knew that. I think Jesus knew that if we could just get this one thing right, if we could just love one another, like he loved us, that that right there has the power to change the world. So let me, let me ask you, if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, you should try this.
this week? What would it look like in, in your own world if you just loved Jesus, loved people like Jesus loved you? What would that look like for you? And you might say, well, Justice, look, you do not know my wife, okay? <laughs> if you only knew. You don't know my crazy kids, okay? You have no idea who my boss is. And there, there's no way, there's no way I could love them. Do you see the, hold on, let's, let's go back to John 13. John 13, um, you say, man, uh, these people, I could love them if they were just more lovable. John 13, look what he said, look at this, the end of this passage that we just looked at. So he tells him this, a new commandment I give you, love one another just as I have loved you, so you also love one another. By this all people will know you're my disciples if you have love for another. Look at what Simon does, verse 36. Lord, where are you going? Like, are you kidding me? So Jesus is like, dude, you, yeah, that love stuff, that's fine, okay. But where are you going? I'm going with you. Look, sometimes it's hard to love people. Can you imagine Jesus spending three years with Peter? Sometimes it's difficult. And we see that he had all his disciples were messed up, and he forgave and loved and, and, and was with them. And, and so you might say, man, I don't... You don't know who I have to try to love. It's like, I get it. Jesus knows. Jesus knows. I mean, he loved you. You're kind of messed up too, okay? And he loved you. So what if you just did that? Just, I'm just going to love. Like Jesus loves me. Now, now look, this is not, that you, you might say, what if you know, I love her for 10 days and she doesn't change? Or I'm loving at my workplace, but I don't get a promotion. Or what if I'm really generous and then I don't get any? It's not a means to an end. It's not I'm loving so that I'll get something. It's I'm loving so that I'm a disciple. I'm loving because I'm a disciple. I'm loving because I follow Jesus. I'm loving because Jesus loved me. If you're not a follower of Jesus, though, and you're here this morning, uh, I hope that you would consider Jesus. Because Jesus, I'm sorry, because everyone in this room right now, we have all fallen short of God's standard. And, and I really do not want you to miss what God has done for you. How, how he made a way for you to be right with him. He made that way by, by dying on a cross in your place. He made a way for you to be right by, by taking the penalty of your sin. But he didn't stay there. He rose from the grave so that you could have new life in him. I pray. My prayer for you is that you would trust Jesus with your life. You'd place your faith in him today. I want, to, I want you to have that opportunity. And so if you're here and you want to give your life to Jesus, I'm just going to ask you to come and tell me. Just come and tell us. Come and let me know. Our prayer team is about to come forward and, and we're going to be up here. If you have any prayer needs, we want to pray for you and with you for anything. But if you want to give your life to Jesus, if you want to trust Jesus as your Savior, come. Come. We want to pray with you. We want to pray with you. Don't just leave right after. If those of you are believers, let's leave here and love like Jesus loved us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, that you loved us. You loved us so much that you gave your life for us. 
so that we could be with you, know you, love you, experience you, God. I thank you that you loved us enough to bring us here this morning and to speak to us. And I pray that you would seal all these things in our heart or that we would leave here and not forget that we would know and remember and be reminded and be convicted of the fact that we need to love like you love. Even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, we'll love like you loved us. I pray for the person right now who, who maybe they came in here and they weren't sure about you, Jesus. They, they didn't know uh, if they had a relationship with you. I pray that they would not leave the room without coming and praying with one of us. You'd capture their heart. You'd trans, transform their life for your glory. That they'd trust you. Place their faith in you right now. Lord, give us wisdom to know what to do with everything that you've taught us today. Give us courage to do it. Lead us by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.